Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 19th General K.S. Timaya Memorial Lecture. As always, it's good to see so many familiar faces, and we are overjoyed to see so many new ones. Thank you for taking the time to be here. KST, as our lecture series is colloquially known, has evolved from having only Cretonians in attendance to a larger event that is attended, dare I say, uh, by a majority of non cretonians Something uh, that I personally enjoy is watching the fellowship that takes place amongst us all uh, over tea and snacks before the lecture, and long may it continue. We pay tribute through these lectures to old Cretonian General K.S. Timaya, India's third and longest serving chief of army staff. After Cotton's, he enrolled at the Royal Indian Military College, Dehradun. He was later one of six Indians to be chosen to attend the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst in 1926. He received the British Distinguished Service Order for his service to the British military during World War II. In the late 1940s, General Timaya was chosen to lead the counter-offensive in Kashmir and headed the Jammu Kashmir force, playing an instrumental role in the consolidation of Ladakh. He went on to become the Chief of Army Staff from 1957 to 1961, and after his retirement, the United Nations requested his services in 1964 to command their troops operating in Cyprus. General Timaya, like most Cretonians, was a compassionate, tenacious soldier who led from the front. His never-say-die attitude, particularly against adversity at our borders, made him an exemplary person and soldier throughout his career. Following in the general's footsteps, his daughter went to Bishop Cotton's, as did his grandson, Mr. Casey Baliapa, who is here with us today. We thank our patrons, Admiral V.S. Shekawat, Lieutenant General S.K. Jetley, and Air Marshal Trevor Osman, who are unable to attend the lecture today, but have sent in their good wishes, support, and their greetings to you all. A warm welcome to Aditya Sondi, founding trustee, former managing trustee, a former KST speaker, and our conscience keeper. C.N. Kumar, our executive patron, who couldn't be here. Former trustees, whom I'm glad to see, Prashant, Kiran Lakhani, Rajiv Purnaya. Our friends from the Old Cretonians Association, boys and girls, Cretonians, present and past, teachers, dear friends from the armed forces, friends of the trust, and young students. Thank you for attending our lectures and showing their support, showing us your support. Thank you. We are happy to have amongst us Mr. Alistair Fries, principal of Bishop Cotton Boys School, and Dr. A. Ebenezer, former principal, Bishop Cotton Boys School. On behalf of our executive patron, Mr. C. N. Kumar, and my fellow trustees, Romil Turakia, Lokesh Ahuja, and Timothy Franklin, I thank you for giving us this opportunity to showcase our alma mater, Bishop Cotton Boys School. As much as KST may evolve into perhaps a Bangalore event or a non cretonian event, the lecture series and the trust were instituted as a means to showcase Cotton's and its alumni to the outside world. On that note, Bishop Cotton's has a new principal, Mr. Alistair Fries. For those of you who don't know him, he's an alumnus of Lama Tenure for Boys Kolkata. He has been assistant headmaster at the Bishop School Pune and principal at Laidlaw Memorial Uti, Tyndale Bisco Srinagar, and Father Agnew School NCR. Like the general and our medalist this afternoon, he also has an athletic side to him, having represented Bengal in under 15 and under 19 cricket and captaining the Super Division League football team of Maharashtra. It is my distinct pleasure to invite on stage Mr. Alistair Fries, principal of the Grand Old School, to say a few words. I can't see a soul. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is with immense, now I can see all the handsome and pretty faces. It is with immense pleasure and pride that we gather here today to celebrate and pay tribute to an exceptional Cotonian, an illustrious Indian, a distinguished military leader, and above all, a remarkable human being. General K.S. Timaya. The legacy of General K.S. Timaya continues to live on in the hearts and minds of every Cotonian, serving as a beacon of excellence, dedication, 
and leadership. His remarkable achievements and values resonate with the core beliefs that our school continues to uphold. It's a testament to the kind of quality, education, and character building that Bishop Cotton Boys School has been committed to for the past one and a half centuries. The General Debaya Memorial is an event that provides each one of us with a holistic understanding of various fields and the kind of excellence that we can aspire to. General K.S. Temaya's life was marked by unwavering dedication to the armed forces, exceptional leadership skills, and a deep commitment to the principles of integrity and service. General Temaya's service spanned several significant events in Indian history. The general played an instrumental role in the Indian Army's operations during World War II, where he de demonstrated his military acumen and leadership abilities. The post-independence era saw Timaya's career ascend to greater heights. His tenure as Chief of Army Staff was marked by numerous challenges, including the India-China dispute in 1959. General Timaya's legacy is not just in the battles he fought or the medals he earned, but in the values he upheld. General Timaya's life is a testament to the indomitable spirit of a true patriot and military leader. His contributions to the Indian Army and his steadfast adherence to principles of honor and integrity make him a revered figure in the annals of Indian military history. As we stand here surrounded by the echoes of the past and the faces that have graced these hallowed walls, we are reminded of the rich tapestry of talent, knowledge, and character that has passed through the doors of Bishop Cotton's. Bishop Cotton's has long been a cradle of excellence, nurturing minds and fostering the growth of countless individuals who have shaped and uplifted society in profound ways. It is indeed an honor and privilege for me to be welcomed to welcome the decorated officers of the armed forces, public spirited citizens and well-wishers of Bishop Cotton Boys School to join us in this endeavor. You men of distinguished honor have carried the torch of learning with you and you have shared its brilliance with the world, be it in the realm of science, arts, business, public service or any other domain. Your achievements have collectively shaped the world we live in today. Cotton's is immensely proud of your accomplishments. As I understand, for every Cottonian, past and present, the General K.S. Timaya Memorial is more than an event. It is an experience that stays with them, guiding their aspirations and motivating them to aim for greatness. They hear firsthand stories of challenges, triumphs, and the relent relentless pursuit of goals. These narratives instill in them a belief that with determination, hard work, and the right values, they too can make a, work, a mark in the world. The event also serves as a moment of reflection for the school, reminding us of the rich legacy we have and the responsibility to nurture and produce leaders of tomorrow. It is an affirmation of our commitment to excellence and our pledge to provide our students with the best opportunities and platforms. As we reunite and reminisce today, let us not only bask in the glory of our past accomplishments, but also forward to the future. General K.S. Timaya's legacy continues to serve as a vibrant reminder that our journey does not end here. It is an ever resonating story of resilience, growth, and social impact. Let us carry forward the lessons and values we learn today in our hearts. 
May our coming together be filled with nostalgia, camaraderie, and share a vision for a better world. May God bless each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fries. Apart from our lectures, we also recognize former members of our teaching, administrative, and support staff with a citation and a check for rupees one lakh each. These sums are made up entirely of donations made not only by Katonians, but also some non katonians And we are grateful to all of our donors. As a policy, we consciously try to ensure that a majority of the recipients of these funds are support and administrative staff. Our recipients include retired gardeners, carpenters, cooks, ground staff, bus drivers, and conductors that have watched over so many young Katonians, retired teachers and principals who have kept us on the straight and narrow. This is our way of giving back to them for all the years that they have invested in looking after generations of young Katonians. The recipients this year are Mrs. Elizabeth Thomas, teacher, 1986 to 2021. Mr. Nagraja Wee, security guard, 1987 to 2023. Magesh V, security guard, 1987 to 2016. Mr. Magesh is survived by his wife, Ms. Daisy Rani, who received the funds on his behalf. Mr. Thomas Atyal, teacher, 1970 to 1981. Ms. L. Lalita, support staff, 1991 to 2023. Mr. L. Rajkumar, security guard, 1987 to 2012. Mr. Rajkumar is survived by his wife, Ms. Sarasa M., who received the funds on his behalf. In the nine years since we initiated the fund, we have handed out around rupees 67 lakh to former staff members of Bishop Cortons. If we were to add the years of service of all our recipients, it would amount, and this, um, this, this number amazes me every year. It's a staggering 1,868 years of collective service to the school. Before we move on to the next part of our program, which is the medal ceremony, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the memory of some of our friends who have passed on in the last year. Mr. M. S. Shankar, beloved sportsmaster. Mrs. Sunita Parashar, beloved teacher, Captain Mohan Kuti, VSM, old Katonian and a dear friend of the Trust. Let us take a moment to remember them as well as others that each of us may have personally lost. on stage, Timothy Franklin, to introduce the General K.S. Timaya Medal. Thank you, Karan, and good morning, everyone. It is a tradition at these lectures to award the General K.S. Timaya Medal to Katonians who have demonstrated exemplary public service. The medal honors the memory and symbolizes the values of the general, who, among his many accomplishments, was also the first commandant of the Indian Military Academy to go on to become chief of staff. The general was also a sportsman whose sporting abilities in cricket, football, hockey, and squash perhaps endeared him enough to his British instructors in the Prince of Wales Royal Indian Military College, Dehradun, to allow him to eventually go on to Sandhurst, which is one of the world's most prestigious military training grounds. Um, in similar fashion, today we, as a token of our great admiration for his long-standing contribution to Bangalore, to India, and to the world, to the students of Bethany School, and to society in the field of school education, we are privileged to present this year's General K. Thimaya Medal to a sportsman, 
musician, educationist, and administrator. Although he studied at Bishop Cotton Boys School for only two years, between 1970 for class 10 and 1972 for pre-university, Robert Kinn counts these as the most exciting and memorable years in his schooling. Like several Catonians, including me, Robert credits Mr. M. S. Shankar, who passed away earlier this year, with identifying his sporting talent. Robert ended up representing the school in cricket, football, under the care of coach Khalil Makri, and athletics. Robert also distinguished himself as a singer during his time at Cotton's. It is these experiences that set him up for a career as a physical education and music teacher at Bethany School. In 1974, when the school had 120 students and 12, 120 students and 12 faculty members, was when Robert entered <laughs> Bethany. It speaks to the content of Robert's character and abilities that Robert has now completed more than 30 years at Bethany School and 50 years this year as an educator. And um, I think that's a, we, this is a big round of applause. <laughs> he has spent the last 18 years as headmaster and principal of Bethany School. And Bethany is now one of Bangalore's top schools with a reputation for strong ethics and musical excellence. I am proud to welcome on stage the General Case Thimaya Medalist for 2023, the long-standing principal of Bethany High, Robert Kinn. I would li like to invite on stage Mr. Casey Beliapa to present the medal. Belly, as he is fondly known, is a renowned security expert, a former member of the French Foreign Legion. Belly is also the general's grandson. He is founder director of Max Grid Security Corps and is co-founder, advisor, and permanent invitee to the managing committee for the Center of, for National Security Studies at the MS Ramaya University of Applied Sciences Casey Beliapa to come and give me the medal. Thank you, Belly, and now request our medalist to speak a few words. Morning, everyone. Like uh, Mr. Free said, I'm not able to see anyone, but uh, at least uh, I think you can hear hear me this morning, and. Uh, <coughs> Don't worry about this paper. I've just put on some points, and uh, I think Karan has given me earlier, he said three minutes. Uh, this morning he said, uh, you can speak for about four or five minutes. I was wondering that whether he was able to give me 49 minutes because of 49 years of service, one minute for each year. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, March the 5th, 2024 will make 50 years of my service in education, and uh, uh, I'm just thankful to God and thankful to members of the trust of the General Karyapa Trust for considering me worthy to receive this honor this morning. And it's not just an honor for me, it's an honor for my alumni, Bishop Cotton, it's an honor for uh, Bethany, it's an honor for each one of you present here, those who have uh, who are here this morning to witness this uh, award ceremony. <laughs> and I'm also conscious that we have a, a guest speaker, so I won't take much time. But uh, just to be able to express my gratitude and thanks to all those who have 
played an important role in my life uh, right from the time I started my career in education. But I must tell you, I must tell you something that you know, my plan and my goal after I finished my 10th and went on to do my PUC in Cottons itself, there was, uh, Cottons has introduced two years of PUC after, the, after my 10th, and uh, my aim was to do medicine. And the founder of Bethany, who took care of me, also encouraged me. And we just saw uh, my teacher, biology teacher, Mr. Atyal, he too encouraged me to do medicine. And the founder even went to the extent of meeting, I think, the then uh, director of St. John's Medical College and uh, uh, spoke to him about me getting into med medicine. And he said, not a problem, let him finish his PU and then come and apply, and we surely will take him in. But then, when I did my second PU in my final exam, there was one subject I failed in. Can you guess which subject that was? It was Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did, I did quite well in all my other subjects, the science subjects, I got a first class. But no fault of the Hindi master, it was not Mr. Lokanath, it was another teacher, I forget his name. Uh, no fault of Cottons, it was my fault, because, you know, uh, I didn't really uh, take that interest in Hindi, and later I knew that, you know, I had to pass Hindi to be able to complete my PU. I did complete my uh, Hindi paper in the supplementary exam or com compartment exam, but in the meantime, before the exam happened, the founder of Bethany School, Mrs. Menon David, who brought me up like her own son, uh, said, uh, son, why don't you just, you know, uh, instead of wasting your time, join Bethany. We need a PE master, we need a music teacher. So that's when I joined Bethany in the year 1974, and on the 5th of March, and uh, I started teaching uh, at Bethany. But before that, uh, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, uh, I had no experience, but it was only out of passion that, you know, I was able to do what I did for Bethany in the years 74, 75, 76. And uh, there are a few people that I just want to pay my tribute and gratitude for being a part of my life, for motivating me, for encouraging me, for uh, doing what they could to bless my life. And uh, the first one is the first person who brought me, I'm from the Andaman Islands, by the way, there was a missionary by the name of Reverend George David who had gone to the Andamans in the year 1958. And in 1963, he brought me to uh, Bangalore for, for studies. I was only about nine years old, and uh, I was under the care of Mrs. Minon David, who started Bethany then in 1963. And she brought me up as her own son. She had lost two of her sons in a tragic drowning accident in Chennai, and she started Bethany in their memory. And I was like a son to her. I need to thank her, too, for taking care of me and, uh, and the one who saw to my education, even was willing to see to my medical, medical education at that time, which didn't happen. I'm also, thanking, I'm also thankful to Reverend Ayal Thomas, who most of you all will know, who took me into uh, Bishop Cotton Boys High School. Mrs. Minon David approached her because Bethany didn't have uh, a tent at that time. Beth Bethany was not recognized at that point of time. And, but she, didn't, she did not leave us. We were three of us in that class in the ninth standard. It was Amar, Akbar, and Anthony, as one of my friends said. I was Anthony, and uh, Amar was Ajit Shah, some of you will know him, and uh, Akbar was Shaukat Ali, uh, one of the outstanding footballers uh, that year. <clears throat> so three of us joined Bishop Cordons, and then I'm also grateful and thankful to my late principal, Mr. A.T. Balraj, he had motivated me and you know, uh, encouraged me in every aspect of uh, school life. And he saw that little spark of leadership, which I didn't see it myself. And you know, in the first year when I joined Bethany itself, uh, I'm sorry, Cottons itself, uh, he had made me the prefect of Pack and Mall's house, the Pack House. And uh, later on, when I joined Bethany, I'd, I had invited him to be our chief guest for one of our sports meet. And after, the, after the, witnessing the sports that I conducted in Bethany, it was just beside, behind Bowen Girls, the field there, the corporation field. One day he sent word for me 
uh, one of the helpers from Cotton's came and said, sir, I want to see you. So I went there. And then I didn't know what he wanted me for. And he says, Robert, uh, can you join Cotton's? And uh, we'll give you a better salary. I'll send you for training. But at the same time, there was another principal of, uh, that principal of uh, Cathedral High School, Brigida Malano. He also called me. He says, Robert, can you join Cathedral High School as a PE master? But then my third calling was back to the Andaman Islands where this missionary had started a school. Reverend George David had started a school. He said, we need you back there. So that's when I went back to the Andaman Islands to serve for about 11 years. And uh, having been in Cottons for one year in the 10th was a very, very eventful year. There were a lot of events that I took part. I think most of the time I was out of the class because uh, you know I was into the football team. I was into the cricket team. Only I, I regret that I couldn't play for the Cotonian Shield because of a six months rule that was uh, in place at that point of time. <clears throat> I was also into the relay team. Some of you all will remember the Trencher brothers. I think three of us. I don't know. I don't remember the fourth one. Uh, maybe Milroy Moses, I think. But I was into that. And then I also got into the choir under Mr. Bruce Gabriel. And he taught me how to play the trumpet uh, when I was in Cotton's. Not only to play the trumpet, but to blow my own trumpet also at times, <laughs> which, which I sort of uh, tell myself not to do it too often. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to Mr. Shankar, Mr. Khalil Makri, Mr. Bruce Gabriel. And because of the, the training that I had that one year in Cotton's, I was able to take up that responsibility in Bethany as a PE master and the music teacher. I'm truly grateful to them. <laughs> of course, uh, there are <coughs> some of my other teachers who I want to mention at this time with gratitude. I think uh, most, of, most of them are no more. I can't forget the education that I got under their guidance, under their care, Mr. D'Souza. There were two D'Souza's, I remember, but I don't remember the initial of this Mr. D'Souza, who was my class teacher. Not the CJ D'Souza, but Mr. D'Souza. Mr. Lo yes? D'Souza. Yeah, yeah, OK, OK. So he was my class teacher, and uh, Mr. Lobo, Mr. Paul Raj, Mr. Nainan, Mr. Atyal. Is Mr. Atyal still around? Yes. yes. OK. Mr. Atyal. Mr. Paul, who was my chemistry teacher. Mr. Jaichand, who was my <laughs> maths teacher. Mr. Ayanga, who was my English teacher. Mr. Lokanath, who was my Hindi teacher. I am indebted to all of them. And of course, Mr. Shankar you know, was one person who faithfully attend the lecture every year. We miss him this year. Of course, Mr. Mark David, some of you will know, he was also a teacher in uh, Bishop Cotton Boys High School and then uh, became the headmaster and principal at Bethany, under, which, under whom I worked. And then uh, when I went back to the Andamans, there was no <coughs> uh, thought of coming back to Bangalore because I was totally involved with the work there in the Andamans, uh, teaching at a, a school amongst my community, helping the community there. But, uh, one fine day, Mrs. Ryle, the daughter of uh, the founder of Bethany, just wrote to me and invited me to come back. And it took me about two and a half years to make a decision to come back to Bethany. And I'm, today I'm with Bethany. And I'm also thankful to our present director, Dr. Akash Ryle, uh, who uh, had the confidence and trust in me to become the headmaster and then the principal. So I acknowledge the, the support of my family, too, in my journey through education. You know, uh, I spend quite a lot of time uh, at, at office, even during the holidays. And uh, that's a time you, you can plan, you can come up, come up with ideas. And sometimes I'm alone in the office, even during the holidays. And uh, sometimes my, my sons say, why do, you, why do you want to go to the office now? Nobody is going there. But my wife tells them that if he doesn't go to the office, he'll fall sick. So. <laughs> So I'm, you know, uh, that's the support, type of support they've given me. So uh, like I said, I started my career in 74 and still uh, going on. And uh, I thank God for this uh, opportunity to be able to be a blessing to the youth and the children that come into our care. Being, uh, being blessed, you know, uh, I want to continue to bless the children that come into our care. Of course. Uh, these are not the 49 years that I've been in education 
It's not without challenges. There, there have been challenges, and what is life without challenge? But with God's help, God's grace, God's gui uh, guidance, we have been uh, able to overcome these challenges. One of the challenges that came, uh, came to me as the principal of the school was in the year two, 2020, during the pandemic. And uh, we didn't know what to do at that point of time. I didn't know what to do. And it was my son who guided me. He says, Dad, why don't you teach online? Then I had no idea what online teaching was. But he guided me. And then we had a good team in, in the school to be able to take this online teaching and learning uh, forward. And it was not just uh, the academics part of it, but we had different events online. And I'm so grateful and thankful for that. And the other challenges, of course, is now uh, <coughs> students are all tech savvy. And uh, the gadget is one problem that we have, uh, the, uh, over, uh, the overuse and the excess use of gadgets. But uh, somehow we have a policy called the digital detox pol policy. And uh, there is a tripart tripartite agreement with the parents, the students, and the school. So this is uh, uh, sort of working out well. The other challenge that we have today is uh, you know, to be able to imbibe in our youngsters good values, the values of empathy, integrity, kindness, and gratitude. And uh, we uh, also want to uh, take up this challenge and see that these youngsters go out into the world as rounded uh, with good values to be able to impart their knowledge and skill into the world. I, I didn't uh, hear, Karan, I didn't hear the school song being sung. Uh, can we all sing it? I don't know if I, re I remember it, but uh, if we can just stand up, I, you know, for, even without any instrument, but I want to, to dedicate this to the, to the school. <coughs> On Catonian, on master on the side of right, much like warriors to the fight, mark the foe and strike with might. Next, extrosome, next, and astrosome. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And we take um, great pride in, in our medalist. And you know, yesterday, one of uh, uh, KST's dear friends, Manav Nagraj, who is also um, who lives very close to Bethany, says, even today, as a long-standing principal of uh, Bethany, sometimes Robert can be spotted um, on the road, marshalling the traffic while the, the, the students cross the road. And that's testimony to the kind of person that Robert is. As we uh, prepare to get into the, uh, the main course for today's uh, proceedings, I'd like to take this time to acknowledge the leadership provided by Romil Turakia, who served as our managing trustee for the last three years, stepping into the big shoes of um, the trust founder, uh, Dr. Aditya Sondi. And Romil has led uh, with a style of um, consensual, um, consensus-based decision making and attention to detail and, and to process, which has really strengthened KST as an institution. And, love, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge his, his role, and if you can give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Romil has passed on the baton to, to Karan Joseph um, as managing trustee. And we continue to benefit from Romil's work ethic and watchful guidance. Um, as we continue the work of this, this trust. And please welcome on stage Roman Tarakia to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tim. Um, I was asked to introduce Ricky, and um, I just told my fellow trustees I probably have no job because Ricky needs no introduction. But I'll try and do justice. Um, Ricky is a three-time Grammy Award winner, a US Billboard number one artist, and GQ Hero 2020. Uh, Ricky is also an internationally renowned Indian music composer and environmentalist. He has performed at prestigious venues in over 30 countries, including the UN headquarters in New York and Geneva. Ricky has won over 100 music awards in 20 countries. He serves as the United Nations Goodwill Ambassador, United Nations Refugee High Profile Supporter, UNESCO MGIEP Global Ambassador for Kindness, UNICEF Celebrity Supporter, and Ambassador for Earth Day Network. Ricky studied at Cotton's from 1988 and passed out of his 10th in 1997. Ricky uh, counts the Catonian Shield matches and the Interhouse music competitions amongst his fondest memories in school. I let Ricky do the rest. Uh, I'll cut short the introduction. I invite Ricky up on stage, please. Namaskar, everyone. Namaste, everyone. Thank you to Ricky Kay for supporting a better, safer, more prosperous future. Ricky Kesh, our champion for nature. I take this opportunity to say thank you to Ricky Kesh. Ricky has been inspiring and is one of our champions. My brother Ricky, I'm really proud of you as, as always. He was a man full of energy, who was ready to work with these young people and happy to bring hope back to their lives. And the Grammy goes to Winds of Sam Sarah. I'd like to thank the Recording Academy. Asatoma Satgamaya Om Shanti 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 Om. Thank you! And the Grammy goes to Stuart Copeland and Ricky in India, we've got a saying called as Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, which literally means the world is one family. Live in peace with all entities on this planet, whether it is the animals, the wildlife, the forest. Stuart Copeland, Divine Ties, and Ricky Cave. Namaste and thank you. Climate change is absolutely real. Climate change is human induced, and our actions are affecting countries on the other side of the world. Just setting up my office over here. <laughs> okay, Yelrigo Namaskara, everyone. The answer to that is Namaskara. Yelrigo Namaskara, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a huge honor for me to be here, especially, you know, uh, my principal is here, uh, Dr. Ebenezer. And of course, my class teacher for 9th and 10th, uh, Pratima Rao, where are you? Again, I can't see the audience, <laughs> like everyone. <laughs> But uh, it's amazing to be here, and especially uh, Pratima Rao, because uh, uh, she's, I think, been to three of my concerts, and she's already sick and tired of me. So, <laughs> but anyway, so as I was introduced, uh, I'm Ricky. Uh, I'm a musician. I'm an environmentalist. Uh, two pillars that have uh, dictated my whole life and every single life decision that I've ever made. Uh, actually, can we light up the audience for the whole thing? Uh, it'll be easier for me to speak if the audience is lit up. Yeah, now the back is lit up. <laughs> ah, that's nice, fantastic. So as I said, I'm a musician and an environmentalist, uh, two pillars that have pretty much dictated my whole life and every life decision that I've ever made. And for the past few years, the only kind of music that I make is about the environment, and it's about social impact around those areas. 
So what I'm going to do with this talk is that uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about my journey becoming an environmentalist. And through that, you will understand my thoughts on music and environment and the intersection of uh, these two amazing things. So ever since I remember, I've always been a musician. Uh, my ears have always been more important than my eyes. You know, while my classmates and my siblings uh, were always obsessed with television, with cartoons, with video games, with visual mediums. Uh, I was always obsessed with my music system. I would listen to music all day long. My father had this huge music collection, and it was not just the hits of that particular era, like Michael Jackson or the Bee Gees or Madonna and other artists uh, like that. But he also had a lot of so-called obscure music from different parts of the world. Uh, like he had a lot of uh, cultural music from, uh, from South Africa, from Senegal, from Vietnam, from China, from uh, Celtic folk music, Latin American music, all of that music. And I would listen to this music all day long, try to pull apart songs, try to understand what are the different uh, musical instruments used in these songs, what are the singers trying to convey through this music, what are the different instrumentalists trying to convey, what are the emotions they're trying to convey. So a lot of my education has actually happened through just listening, uh, listening to music. And it was through music that I fell in love with the natural world. Now, uh, I grew up, uh, the place where I grew up, uh, uh, you know, uh, the first few years of my life was sort of like in the middle of nowhere, a lot of wooded areas around my home, lots of trees, lots of vegetation. And that would encourage a whole lot of so-called dangerous and creepy crawly animals entering my home. And that would happen on a regular basis. And while my Parents and my teachers would tell me that as soon as you see these animals, just step on them and kill them, or uh, you know, or run away from them. Uh, you know, I used to be drawn towards these animals, and I would go uh, in front of a snake, or go in front of a lizard, or a chameleon, try to look into their eyes, try to see personality in every single animal, try to think of them as being my brothers and sisters, and I would try to figure out, you know, being a child, you know, I would try to figure out what uh, kind of people they are and, you know, and uh, what kind of families they come from or what kind of music do they like. So I was a very weird child growing up and I sort of started feeling that, you know, I liked hanging around with animals more than I did with human beings. <laughs> so, so all of that happened. And, uh, and of course, uh, I, uh, you know, and my question to my parents and teachers used to always be that, you know, if these animals are supposed to be killed the minute you see them, uh, then uh, why do they exist? They obviously have some sort of purpose. And these were the questions that would keep me awake at night. And of course, now all of us know that every single species of animal, no matter how seemingly dangerous or seemingly insignificant, is a really important part of our ecosystem. And it's this delicate balance of this ecosystem that keeps all of us alive and serves all of us equally. So, and of course, like, you know, music and nature for me was always one entity. And again, during those days, it was difficult for me to explain. But of course, now we know because uh, how did music start at the end of the day? Music started off as sounds from within nature. Sounds of the birds, sounds of the animals, sounds of the wind, sounds of the raindrops. And then slowly we human beings started imitating these sounds and making it more pleasing for the human ear. And then we started taking objects from nature and creating musical instruments out of them, like bamboo flutes and boxes of seeds and uh, percussion instruments using animal skin and stuff like that. And it's only for the last 1,000 or 2,000 years that music has actually become academic with notes and scales and rags and things like that. And if you look at indigenous populations, not only in India, but everywhere in the world, uh, their music still is a very strong reflection of nature, not only in the way they create the music, not only in the way the music sounds, but also in the thematic elements of their music. Uh, their music is usually themed around coexistence and around the natural world, around harvest and things like that, you know, all the good stuff in life. <laughs> but anyway, so. Many years later, uh, uh, you know, as we all know, it's in our 12th grade that we have to make a very strong decision as to what we want to do with the rest of our lives. So I had made a very strong decision that I'm going to be a musician for the rest of my life. Music is going to be my profession. And I went to my father, who is a third generation doctor and an Indian parent. And <laughs> you already know where I'm getting to. So I went to him and I told him that, Dad, uh, you know, I want to be a musician. I want to be a professional musician, and I want to do music for the rest of my life. I want music to be my hobby, my profession, my bread and butter, everything that I do. And I want to do music till the day I die. And my father looked at me as if I was absolutely crazy. He said that, yeah, of course you can do music, but what are you going to do for a living? You know, <laughs> Because he could not, for the life of him and my family, they could not imagine music actually being a profession. 
So there was a lot of heartache at home, a lot of pushing and pulling, a lot of fighting, a lot of fireworks at home. And at the end of it, I reached a compromise with my parents that I would finish off a degree in dental surgery. And once I get that degree in dental surgery, my life is my own, and they will never question me again for the rest of my life. So that's what I did. I went to five years of dental college. <laughs> And um, yeah, my musical, my professional musical career had already started by then. So in the mornings from 9 to 5, I would be in a dental college. And from 5 o'clock onwards to about usually 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, I would be at some studio. And by then, I had already started recording professionally. Uh, I was doing commercials for television and radio for various brands. And uh, I was also a part of various uh, uh, bands. And, uh, you know, and I was traveling around India and all of that stuff. And, Nevertheless, at the end of five years, I did not know anything in dentistry, but I got a degree in dental surgery, <laughs> which is quite a testimony to the way things are right now. So I got the degree, and I went to my father, and very ceremoniously, the day I got my degree, I gave it to him, and I told him that dentistry is a very, very noble profession. I know about that, you know, the way that my mouth is functioning right now. <laughs> but nevertheless, dentistry is a very, very noble profession. And I told him that, but it's not for me. I'm a musician. I'm a born musician. That's the only thing I know how to do. So I'm going to be a full-time musician instead of being an evening musician now. So as I said, that there was no looking back after that. And instead of doing music in the evenings, I was doing music uh, uh, throughout the day and night and every waking or sleeping moment uh, that I had. So as I said, I started off my musical journey uh, creating commercials for television and radio. That's how I was making my money. That's how I was making a living. That's how I was proving to my parents I made the right decision. And uh, in a very short span, or long span, whatever you may call it, in about 13 or 14 years, uh, I, uh, I created more than 3,500 commercials. So I was working really hard. And I was very successful doing that. In fact, I was probably the most successful person in Asia doing commercials for television and radio. So I'd done commercials for brands like Google, Microsoft, Airtel, Vodafone, TVS, Suzuki, Lufthansa, Delta, uh, McDonald's, KFC. If you name the brand and the competitor in any part of the world, I was basically doing, I was uh, basically composing music for them. So after doing this for about 13 years, it sort of struck me that these big brands have understood the power of music that they've understood the power of music so much so to sell something, because they're always trying to sell something. But they've understood the power of music so much so that they're ready to spend a few thousand dollars on me to create a piece of music for them to sell their product. And not only that, they're ready to spend a few million dollars to actually air this music on television and radio, because that's how much it costs to air this music, uh, especially when it comes to a television commercial. So they understood that music is a really powerful language, not just for communicating a message, and I repeat, a message of sales in their case, uh, but also to retain that message deep in the consciousness of a listener. Like, for example, the songs that we learned during our childhood are songs that we never forget, like the school song that we all sang just now. And uh, if there are morals in those songs, or if there is a product placed somewhere in those songs, that never leaves us. Uh, so that is basically the power of music. Every country has got a national anthem, you know? And um, especially with us, with our national anthem, the minute you hear the first few notes of the national anthem, it arouses a sense of patriotism and love for the country, and people on either side of the political aisles come together and, you know, and celebrate this great nation. So basically, that is the power of music. So I realized that I, as a musician, need to harness the power of music because there are so many things that I feel strongly about. Like I just mentioned that I've been an environmentalist, things like that I felt strongly about, about climate action and things like that. So I decided that, all right, you know, I'm going to harness the power of music in my own way. And in my own tiny capacity, I'm going to ensure that I'm going to try to make this world a better place through my music. And that's what started off another journey. Now, when I started off that journey and I stopped doing commercials, I started doing albums. And uh, I was an independent artist, what you would call an independent artist. I never entered Bollywood, and never am I going to enter Bollywood. But that is a discussion for a, another day, or maybe the Q&A, you can ask me a question on that. But anyway, so, uh, so I, uh, I started working with a whole lot of record labels all over the world. And I was working with Universal Music in the USA, uh, with Water Tower Records, Vari Sarabande, Water Music Records, EMI, Virgin, Sony working with all of these labels, making albums. And my 16th album is the album that won me my first Grammy Award, an album called Winds of Samsara, uh, which was an album based on the ideals of peace and tolerance by Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. It was a collaboration between me and a South African flute player. 
So after this album uh, uh, became hugely commercially successful, also uh, became critically acclaimed, I did another album which was sort of like my epic album for environmental consciousness. So this album was called Shanti Samsara. This album featured 500 musicians from over 40 countries. So it was this huge epic album, basically uh, uh, featuring musicians from Peru, from of course USA, from India, uh, from China, from, uh, uh, from uh, 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 Vietnam, from uh, Korea. Uh, uh, basically, like I can't even name the country, Azerbaijan, Turkey, basically every corner of the globe that I could find a musician who felt as strongly as I did about climate action, I basically collaborated with them. So the album was released at the Climate Change Conference in Paris, that is the COP21. It was released by our Honorable Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi ji, and the then French President, Francois Hollande, and the then Secretary General of the UN, that is Ban Ki-moon. The three of them released it at the main stage at the Climate Change Conference in Paris in 2015, the COP21. For those of you who do not remember the COP21, um, first of all, it's the one which Trump pulled out of and made very famous all over the world. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's basically the largest conference of nations ever in the history of our planet. 195 presidents and prime ministers coming together under one roof to discuss how do we mitigate the effects of climate change and how do we create a future that is more conducive for our future generations. So uh, it was released over there. And, while, and then, of course, that album, I ended up performing that album in more than 30 countries all over the world and uh, you know and uh, uh, you know and it was quite a successful album in that way you know creating uh, the impact uh, creating the desired impact that I wanted it to create uh, I still perform that uh, album everywhere anyway so coming back to the climate change conference in Paris the COP21 so obviously I was watching the climate change conference very intently also because you know my album had released there and uh, the way that these conferences work is that they've got one main plenary hall, uh, which can accommodate a few thousand people. And at that main plenary hall, uh, and the conference goes on for about nine or 10 days. And at that main plenary hall, uh, every single world leader, every single president and prime minister goes up on stage and gives a presentation for about 10 or 15 minutes. The presentation could be about anything, about their thoughts on climate change, their philosophies on it, what their country is doing to mitigate its effects, or, or whatever they want to convey to the whole world. So I was watching very intently. A lot of presidents and prime ministers gave some really beautiful and remarkable speeches. But one world leader who absolutely caught my attention was President Anote Tong, of the island nation of Kiribati, the Pacific island nation of Kiribati. Now, President Anote Tong, he went up on stage and he gave a presentation which was just 30 seconds or even lesser than that. So he went up on stage and he said that all you 195 countries present over here, please pass a resolution that ensures that my people of Kiribati stay above the water. And then he walked off stage. That's all he did. And it was truly shocking. And of course, I was extremely ashamed because I'd not even heard of this country, let alone her disastrous fate. So of course, I went on Google and I started figuring out what Kiribati is. And I realized that Kiribati is a country in the South Pacific. Uh, 20, 21 inhabited islands, used to be 33 inhabited islands, now it's 21 inhabited islands, very low-lying atoll islands. And uh, they are very geographically significant because uh, they are on the intersection of the international date line and the equator. So they have got landmark, they are the only country in the world that has got landmarks in all four quadrants of our planet. So they bring in the New Year's every year, they bring in the sunrise every morning. And they are predicted to be the first country in the world that's going to go completely underwater due to climate change. And it is irreversible, which means during our lifetime, the tallest point in any of the 21 islands is going to go completely underwater and submerged. So which means that we're going to have to redo our maps and our globes, because the part where Kiribati is on our maps, maps and globes, we're going to have to paint in blue, because they're just going to disappear from the face of the Earth. So I had to see things for myself. So on a United Nations mission, by then I was already a goodwill ambassador with the UN. So I went over there. I spent a lot of time with their uh, people, fell in love with their culture, fell in love with their traditions, fell in love with their musical forms. Uh, spent a lot of time with their president, Anote Tong, their three-term president. Now he's no longer the president because he's termed out. Uh, he's finished his three terms, so he can no longer be the president. But he's sort of like what I call the Mahatma Gandhi of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, spent a lot of time with him. And I realized that this is a country that lives within nature. This is a country that has negligible carbon uh, emissions, almost no pollution, zero industrialization. 
But yet, if all of our countries, like uh, developing nations and developed nations, if all of us countries, if we can build domes around our borders and keep our carbon emission and pollution within our own borders, then countries like Kiribati have nothing to worry about. But then the problem is that it's only one atmosphere and a really thin atmosphere. And of course, as we all know, our carbon emission and pollution becomes everybody's carbon emission and pollution, spreads around the world, fill up, fills up that thin atmosphere because of this global temperatures rise, because of this polar ice caps melt, because of this ocean levels rise. And since Kiribati are low-lying atoll islands, in fact, some of the lowest-lying uh, islands in the world, they are suffering the consequences of our actions. And that's the problem with climate change, that people who are least at fault when it comes to climate change are the ones who are suffering the most. So the president told me two really important things which I would like to uh, sort of slightly paraphrase and tell you. He said that we as Kiribati are very low-lying islands, so we are at the front line of climate change. Okay, we are at the front line of climate change, and we are going to fall for sure. And when we fall, that front line is going to keep receding and moving back till those people and those countries who felt that they would never be affected by climate change will eventually be affected, and that is the reality of the situation. The second thing he told me was that in your countries, that is developed nations and developing nations, basically any country besides his own, he said that when there is a cyclone or a hurricane, then water enters your homes, right? Water enters your home. But at some point in time, the water will move back. It will go back. But he's like, in his case of climate change, the water enters our home, and it just keeps entering, it just keeps entering, it just keeps coming in, till that time when their home and their ancestral land becomes part of the ocean bed. And then it just disappears, and it's finished. So that's what he talked about. So of course, being a musician, I made some music with their president, made some music with their local musicians. And uh, that's what I'm going to be playing for you. It's a song called Song for Kiribati. And uh, here it is. The science is very clear about climate change. Within the century, our entire nation will be underwater. As in some countries, you have a cyclone, a hurricane. Over time, the land remains there. The water recedes. In our case, it does not. It's a disaster that doesn't go away. Our reality is that uh, we have communities who already have to relocate, left their villages. We have communities which are on the verge of doing the same thing. For us, climate change is not something that's likely to happen in the future. It is happening, we are facing it. referred 
our situation as those countries on the front line. Because when we fall, there'll be another front line. And that front line will keep moving back until those countries and those people who believe uh, they will not be affected will eventually be affected. And that is the reality we are facing. I think as human beings, we are being challenged. Should we do something about it? And I believe, yes, everybody has the responsibility to do it. So all those uh, children from Kiribati that you saw in that video, if you can only think about it, that these children will not have the opportunity to grow up in their own country. Because very soon, they're going to become refugees of a new kind. And that is known as climate refugees. So this song itself, I've performed it multiple times now at the United Nations headquarters in New York and in Geneva. And it has had the desirable impact where uh, from countries and nations not bothering about Kiribati, now suddenly, when it comes to climate change and climate action, Kiribati is now on the top of their minds. Because Kir Kiribati can be easily showcased. We may or may not be able to do something about their future, but Kiribati can be showcased by all of these leaders, and now it's being showcased by the United Nations as a clear example of a country, uh, uh, as a clear example that climate change is not some vague phenomenon that may or may not happen in the future. Climate change is absolutely real. Climate change is happening right now. Climate change is human-induced. And there are current victims of climate change. And most importantly, our actions sitting down over here are having disastrous consequences on people on the other side of the world. You know, and that's the reality of climate change. Now, anyway, coming back to India, uh, I'm very proud to be an Indian because we in India, we've lived in coexistence with our forests and wildlife for the longest period of time. In fact, we pray to our forests, we pray to our wildlife, we revere our forests, we revere our wildlife. And emblematic of this reverence that we have for our forests and wildlife is one particular animal, and that is the elephant. Everyone loves the elephant. Elephant is a beautiful animal. It's symbolic of India. But with growing human population, with growing human greed, with growing human need, with, uh, uh, with growing human uh, world desires, What's happening is that we are destroying their habitats, we are destroying their homes, we are fragmenting their habitats, we are destroying their food sources. And because of this, we've got something known as human and elephant conflict. Now, human and elephant conflict, what is it? It's basically a warlike situation that is happening between humans and elephants. There is also human and tiger conflict. There are various conflicts that we have because we are built to have conflict. But nevertheless, uh, what we're going to talk about today is human and elephant conflict because it's, it's quite severe. Now, in this kind of a warlike situation between humans and elephants, the human and elephant conflict, when there is lo there's loss of life and property on both sides of the spectrum. But if there is loss of life and property on the human side, then our authorities have to make the really, really painful decision uh, to capture these elephants and to relocate them. Now, mind you, this is a very uh, humane solution because you're not actually shooting the elephant. You're just capturing the elephant and you're relocating the elephant. But this capturing and relocating process itself is extremely excruciating, mentally traumatic. It is extremely painful, not just for the elephants involved, which is pretty obvious, but it is also for all the humans involved in this entire process, especially our Indian Forest Department, because they are the ones who are tasked with this. Now, I've traveled in every corner of the world. I've met foresters everywhere in the world in my various roles. And uh, I can tell you this with absolute and complete conviction that our Indian Forest Department is the best department in the whole world when it comes to forest departments. I think they deserve a round of applause, I think. Because you will never find a set of more passionate people than our Indian Forest Department. I'll give you an example. If you speak to anybody from our Indian Forest Department and you speak about, what, about, a, about a red chair, let's say, you speak about a red chair to them, they'll be able to hold the conversation for maybe about three or four minutes before it, the conversation starts going into forests and wildlife and stuff like that. Because that's the only thing that they can talk about and that's the only thing they think about. And this is without exception with every single one of our foresters. So anyway, so this next song which I'm going to show you is a song called Love Divine. It's a song that is dedicated to our Indian Forest Department. It's dedicated to the magnificent animal, the elephant. And we have to keep in mind that just because the elephant is the largest walking mammal on our planet, that does not mean that the elephant does not need our protection. 
In fact, it is the exact opposite. It is for this very reason that the elephant needs our protection the most. So here is my song, it's called Love Divine. In 2020, there was this photograph that had gone completely viral across uh, the world, not just in India. Few of you may remember it, it was the beginning of the pandemic. It is a photograph of a pregnant female elephant uh, who had uh, passed away uh, standing in a water body. So it was this very heartbreaking image of this female pregnant elephant standing in the middle of a water body and she was dead. And uh, of course, this uh, image went viral every single publication everywhere in the world, whether it's New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, uh, South African Times, every newspaper everywhere in the world, and in fact, every single daily in India had published that particular picture. Now, the story behind that uh, death was that uh, there was this female pregnant elephant. She was in search of food. She wandered out of the forest. Uh, she went into a neighboring farmland, and uh, she found a fruit over there, a pineapple. So she picked up the pineapple, she ate it, but little did she know that the pineapple was filled with explosives. So she ate the fruit, and of course, the explosives fatally damaged her mouth, and then she wobbled away, wobbled away, and then she walked almost a kilometer and a half to a water body. She stood right in the middle of the water body, and she died while she was standing. 
Now, of course, the image was extremely powerful. So it invited a whole lot of reactions, a lot of knee-jerk reactions from around the world. A lot of the youth especially said that, you know, this, uh, uh, that the farmer should be hung upside down, the farmer should be killed, the farmer should be mauled, the farmer should be put into jail for the rest of uh, his life, whatever, whatever, whatever. And of course, the farmer needs to be punished. It is a very, very strongly punishable offense. But if you think about it, if you start looking inwards, like the song says, mirror, mirror on the wall. So basically, if you start looking inwards and you think about it, that we as city people, we live in bubbles. You know, we are so detached from what is happening in rural India. We are so detached from it. We live in complete bubbles. So imagine if we do not have electricity for five minutes, we are so inconvenienced. Five minutes, no electricity, we are so inconvenienced. If uh, Apple comes out with a new iPhone and it goes out of stock, or OnePlus comes out with a new phone and it goes out of stock, and we can't buy it for a couple of days, we're like, why can't they manufacture more of these? You know, what's wrong with them? Why can't they just make uh, how many more products that we demand for? And if you think about it, where is all that coal coming from for all our electricity? Where is all that uh, metals coming from for building our electronic gadgets, our magnesium, lithium, iron, uh, iron uh, cadmium, uh, uh, silica, all of these metals, where is it coming from? It's coming from digging those forests. That's all. So it's our consumption patterns which are digging up those forests of those elephants and destroying their habitats and destroying. It's our traveling needs which is creating these roads in the forest, which is creating these railway lines in the forest. It's, it's completely our consumption patterns which are destroying the food sources of those elephants. The elephant has got no other alternative but to find food outside of the forest, so gets into a farmland. And the poor farmer, he or she has to make the really painful decision and a punishable decision, but a very painful decision to protect his or her livelihoods and to protect the lives of his or her family. And they have to do this ridiculous thing of putting explosives in the fruits. So if you think about it, we have to start looking inwards and figure out what is it that we are doing. Whenever these kind of problems happen, we are quick to point a finger at somebody else. But the best way to solve problems when it comes to the environment is always to look inwards and see what can I do to bring about a change? What can I do? How am I at fault when it comes to this? Because when it came to that elephant's death, every single city person in India was basically at fault uh, when it came to that elephant's death probably very little when it comes to the villager. The villagers were just the end result of that. They were the end of that, but, the, but we were all at fault. Now, when it comes to all the problems that we face on our planet, uh, we already spoke about a bunch of them. There is climate change, there is species extinction, there is deforestation, there are forest fires, there's plastics pollution, there's air pollution, so many societal issues like hunger, poverty, uh, malnutrition, uh, education, gender inequality, gender violence, uh, water, sanitation, so many of these problems. I believe that the biggest threat to us as a species, as a human species, the biggest threat to us is the constant thought that we have that somebody else will make a difference. You know, we're always waiting for governments to make a difference, for intergovernmental bodies, uh, uh, leaders, corporations, uh, you know, we're NGOs, we're waiting for all of them to make a difference when the truth is that the only way we can bring about meaningful change is if we change ourselves and bring about behavioral change. Now, all of us talk about changing the world. We always talk, we always have that idea that we want to change the world and this is how we can change the world, this is how we can bring about massive change. But we very, very rarely talk about changing ourselves. And that's not because we're evil people or we're bad people. That's simply because we haven't empowered ourselves to believe that the small, tiny, incremental changes that we make within our own lives actually matter. We always believe that we are very insignificant. Like, well, if I stop using single-use plastics, what difference will it make? Or if I, stop, if I reduce my use of fossil fuels, what difference will it make? If I use public transportation, how will it matter? Or if I'm kind to people, how will it matter, you know? So we, we just have not empowered ourselves to believe that we are significant. Now, how do we change mindsets? Now, I've uh, said in the beginning that music is a really, really powerful language, not just for communicating a message, but for retaining that message deep in the consciousness of a listener. The songs that we learned during our childhood are songs that we never forget. So I believe that uh, we can showcase, and also what I wanted to say is that everybody on this planet is aware of all these problems that I mentioned. Maybe not at an analytical level, maybe not at a scientific level, but every single person knows that, okay, there's something called as climate change. You know, species are dying, forests are being cut. Everybody is aware of these problems. As I said, not, maybe not at a micro level, but everybody's sort of aware of it. So the golden question is not how do we 
create awareness of these issues, but how do we convert this mere, mere awareness of issues into taking concrete steps and action? That is basically the golden question. Now we can showcase a ton of scientific data to people, and the scientific data is of course really, really important. But we can showcase a whole lot of scientific data to people, and it'll probably not change any mindsets. We can showcase a ton of analytics and, uh, and uh, data to people, um, uh, you know, and statistics to people. That will also probably not bring about behavioral change. What is needed, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, is for artists like me, artists who are in the audience, basically to take these complex ideas and thoughts and to convert them into the emotional and the simple language of music or arts so that you're reaching the hearts and the souls of people. And that is what will bring about behavioral change. And that is what is extremely important. Because art should not be just about entertainment. Art should, be also, uh, art should also be about delivering a message which is really important and delivering a message that can benefit humanity in general. So that's what I've made my life's mission about, about taking these complex ideas, taking these complex thoughts, whatever I read in the newspapers, whatever I feel strongly about, and converting that into the emotional language of music, and thus trying my real, real best to uh, change mindsets through the emotional language of music. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to end my talk over here so that we can open it up for interactions. But uh, I'm going to end with this, that we in India, uh, we acknowledge, all of us do acknowledge that we are much more than just human beings. In fact, we human beings have been on this land for three lakh years. But our forests and wildlife have been here for 3,000 lakh years. So where is three lakh years? Where is 3,000 lakh years? So basically, the true citizens of our country are actually our forests and wildlife because they have existed on our land long before any humans have ever set foot here. So uh, what I did was that I created an instrumental version of our national anthem. And uh, for this instrumental version of our national anthem, I decided to dedicate it to the forests and wildlife of our country because, as I said, without our forests and wildlife, without thriving ecosystems, without healthy forests, uh, we as human beings will cease to exist. So if, uh, if you would please indulge me, let us all rise. If you are able to stand up, let us all rise for the true citizens of India, uh, the forest and wildlife, and let us all rise in honor of our Indian national anthem. <laughs> I'd be glad to take any questions. <laughs> we'll start with principle. <laughs> most wonderful, very profound, and enlightening message. Congratulations to you. Thank you. And uh, as principal, I am truly proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> All over the world, you are known as a great musician and a great environmentalist. My question is, in what ways can music inspire and mobilize people to take action towards protecting 
environment. So what I'll do is that I answered a bit of your question during my talk. But uh, what I'll talk about is that uh, uh, I'll go back to my thought um, in the beginning of my talk where I said that, uh, uh, that you know, the songs that we learn during our childhood are songs that we never forget. So I've started this educational program. And a lot of you are educationists over here, so maybe you can help me out with it. It's called My Earth Songs. Now, My Earth Songs, basically what it is is that it's, it's 30 songs, and I keep refreshing them, uh, 30 songs which are uh, which are based on uh, uh, which are based on the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So basically, uh, we've got song, uh, songs on uh, on uh, basic things like you know sharing and caring and things like that, and also a song on the rhinoceros, a song on the elephant, a song teaching children what a carbon footprint is. The chorus of that song goes like, "I'm going to leave a mark on this planet, but it's not going to be a carbon footprint," and you know, and things like that. So they're all children's songs. Uh, they are uh, targeted for ages of uh, one to eight. And in fact, uh, 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 yeah, Karan's mom has helped me out a lot. Where's Karan? Ah, there, there, there. Karan's mom has helped me out a lot with it. She works with, uh, with the Macmillan Publishers. So Macmillan Publishers, uh, uh, actually, I got to know Karan through your mom, right, first. <laughs> so that is uh, funny. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, Macmillan Publishers has published this in a few million textbooks across uh, India, like in, in CBSE and ICSE textbooks. And the idea behind these songs is that all the songs are very positive. They are, they are fun. Uh, the, uh, the motive behind it is to replace the existing rhymes, because Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star does not teach you anything about stars. And Baba Black Sheep does not teach you anything about sheep. And of course, there are more problems with that. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, the idea behind these songs is that to, uh, to actually, uh, because I, I mean, I'm trying to get my thoughts uh, right over here. But the idea is, is that I believe that children are born with these natural uh, you know, qualities of kindness, empathy, environmental consciousness. But we are sort of like you know, systematically erasing it from them. You know? That's what we're doing. Uh, so I believe that these are songs which will help, in, uh, help uh, reinstill or continue, uh, 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 continue uh, I mean, that these children will continue having these uh, amazing, um, amazing qualities. And uh, yeah, and that's what. And then probably inspire a new generation of environmentally conscious and uh, sustainability conscious uh, you know, human beings in our country. So uh, right now, we have already impacted a whole lot of kids. We receive a lot of mails. We receive a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, lot of emails from, uh, 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 from schools that, you know, that there was, they had an open space and they were planning to build a building. And the children protested against it. And children are shaming their parents into action because children are sort of like, you know, they are, they are more, uh, they've got the ability to adopt these good practices much faster than us adults. Because we adults, we always think about convenience. We think about economics. We think about, you know, uh, think about the systems around us and compatibility and all of that stuff. Whereas children, when they find something that is good, they just say, that, OK, it's, it's something that is good. It's something that's good for everybody. Why, why can't I just adopt it right now, you know? So that's what. So basically, uh, this, this particular education program is shaming a lot of adults into action through children. <laughs> yeah. By a show of hands, please. Uh, all those who have questions, can you please? Uh, is it the same question that you asked me before? No, it's a little more broad. <laughs> Sorry, just I, I, I'll. I'll uh, can, can we just, all those who have questions, can you raise your hands, please? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, can we go to the gentleman on the left? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Aritra. Um, firstly, thank you for a beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, I'll just get to the question. Um, as a musician, how have you found your like collaboration principles changing as you started off, as you mentioned, with bigger brands, and now you work with, um, as you mentioned, 500 artists on an album? Um, like. What have like the jam sessions been like, and do you like introduce like newer genres to them, or do you just play to their strengths? Um, what you know, how has that journey been, and how has it changed you as a musician? So, Romil, I just want to know how much of time do we have for the questions? Um, we do have. We're, we're running out of time, and we have 15 more minutes. Okay, fine, fine. So I'll just make this quick. Okay, sit down. Yeah. So, what I can tell you is that uh, right up to I'll just uh, try to keep it as concise as possible. So, right up to my late my previous album that is Divine Tides, which won me two Grammy Awards, that particular album, which was with Stuart Copeland, I was always in control of my albums. So I was the final decision maker. Everything was based on what I wanted. But of course, I only, uh, with all the musicians in my albums, I only work with, I mean, a secret of the way that I work is that I only work with musicians who are better than me. 
You know, so every single musician you will find in the credits of my album is a musician who is better than me. Because that's the only way I will learn and th that way I will grow and these musicians will take my compositions to uh, places which I would never imagine and take it into, uh, you know, uh, take it to a level which, you know, I cannot take it to. So I make the compositions, I work with musicians who are absolutely amazing and I learn from them and I grow. But at the end of the day, it's my decision and I'm the final word on everything. Now, when I, uh, uh, I worked on this album, Divine Tides, so it was an album which I had initiated during the beginning of the pandemic, that is 2020. So it was a, uh, it was a seven year follow up to uh, my previous Grammy award winning album, that is Winds of Samsara. I always wanted to make a follow up to that album. And then, but I had a relentless touring schedule, so I could not sit down in a very concentrated manner, in a focused manner, and make a new album. But in the pandemic, all of us had to be indoors. I was stuck in my studio. And then I decided that I'll work on this follow-up. So I started working on the first few notes of that album. And then I decided that I wanted to work with uh, a very strong collaborator. So I contacted Stuart Copeland, who was Stuart Copeland being the drummer of the police and the founder of the police. He's the one who auditioned Sting into the band. And, you know, and uh, he's known, Rolling Stone has called him the greatest drummer in the history of music. So, and of course, I grew up with posters of him on my wall and, you know, and all of that stuff. I was like, a, so he's been my childhood idol. So I thought at the most, what is he going to say? He's going to say no, you know? So I got in touch with him through a friend's friend and uh, I sent him an email. I did not hear from him. About like a few weeks later, I actually got a phone call from him and I said that, I, I mean, he said that I listened to the music and uh, he said that I really like the music. So let's work on this album. And then it was a year long collaboration working with him on that album. And I had made a strong decision there that He's a person who I idolize, 75 million albums sold. He himself has composed the music of 50 Hollywood soundtracks, including Wall Street and Oscar winning movies and things like that. So I decided that what I'm going to do with, in this collaboration is that whatever he asks me to do, I'm going to do. Even if I think it is completely wrong, even if I think it is not going at all in line with the album and what he's saying is complete rubbish, I'm still going to go ahead with it, finish it off. I'm going to live with it for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, if I still feel that it is not right, I'm going to voice my opinion. But till then, I'm not going to voice my opinion. So I did that. And there were at least 30 to 40 times during that year where I felt that what he's doing is completely wrong. I'm like, that's just not going to work. But I would just do it. And at the end of two weeks, every single time, I would listen to it. And I would be like, thank God I listened to him. You know, so that is what. So sometimes you have to, you have to lose control, you know. Because sometimes whatever you're thinking, you fall in love with your own ideas, you fall in love with your own thoughts, and you cannot look at things from another perspective. But when you give it time, you start realizing that the other person's perspective is correct. And it's the same thing with life in general, you know? So that was a huge life lesson in me that, you know, that you have to look at everything from different perspectives, even if you think it is absolutely wrong. And then slowly you will start realizing that it is correct. So that was the dynamic for me with collaborating with him. Thank you. We have a question from Manav. Yeah. Um, Until then, yeah. very young people uh, asking questions here. So after Manav. Yeah, Ricky, this is uh, nothing to do about your environmental activism or you know your music, but this is more about Ricky as a person. Sure. Uh, a lot of us who are in several other professions or jobs or vocations, we listen to music to unwind. Yeah. When you listen to music, it's probably <coughs> part of your thing, you know, inspiring you to do the next thing. What do you as a person do to unwind? No, I listen to music also. So there is a lot of music that I listen to. Like, uh, for example, I, uh, uh, I, there are so many genres that I do not make music in. Like, for example, heavy metal and things like that. And I listen to a lot of heavy metal. So the, that's... Huh? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. I can detach myself from it and I can enjoy music uh, a lot. Uh, so that way, because the thing is that uh, when music becomes academic, that is when... Uh, uh, let me explain it to you in this way. Sometimes uh, when a person makes a piece of music, it is about showcasing their music abilities. Or sometimes it is about communicating a message and an emotion. So if, if the musician gets, uh, gets it right, gets the production right, and uh, gets a song right, and even if it is mixed badly or it is sung badly, but if it has that connect, then you stop thinking about all the technical aspects. And for me, I like those kind of songs where it may, where like few seconds into the song, I forget about the technical aspects of it and I get drawn into the emotion of the song. So there are lots of songs like that that I absolutely love and I listen to uh, quite repeatedly. So that's the thing, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm Janvi. From Hi, Janvi. Okay, so my question is, as a teenager, what is like one of the simplest things that you can do to prevent climate change? So I can tell you what I do in my life, 
Okay, so that I'm not preachy. So I can tell you what I do in my life. There are basically four things that I do in my life. And then maybe anybody can take whatever you want from there. So the first thing that I do is that uh, I do not subscribe to fast fashion. That is something that's very strict. You see the suit that I'm wearing right now? Go onto my Instagram page, you'll find it at least in about 12 to 13 different events that I've worn it at. The same suit with the tie, everything. So basically that. So I buy good quality clothes and I constantly rewear it. Like for example, uh, uh, I uh, bought an Achkan, a Sherwani, uh, for the time when I won my Grammy Award earlier this year in uh, February. And I wore it on stage, collected the trophy. And since then, yesterday in fact, was my 42nd concert that I've worn that exact same Sherwani at. So, because fast fashion is one of the most polluting industries, all of us know that. And uh, the fact is that the earth does not remember what you've worn. The earth definitely remembers how you treat it, you know? The second thing is that, uh, is, a, is again something that should not be forced on people uh, because it's a personal choice and it is a, it's got a lot of cultural significance and traditional significances, but I uh, follow a meat-free diet. I'm an aspiring vegan, but I've not been able to get there uh, uh, because uh, there are certain things that I cannot give up while I'm traveling. But I'm an, I'm a, I, I have a meat-free diet because again, the meat industry is a very polluting industry. The third thing is that uh, I do not own a car. So I used to be car crazy. I used to own three cars right up to 2013. Since uh, 2013, I sold all three of my cars because I realized that when I'm traveling abroad or I'm traveling to other cities, I'm using public transportation. Why can't I do that in my own city? So now uh, I, use, uh, I use buses, I use uh, the metro, and when needed, I hire a taxi. So that's what I do. I don't own a car at all. And uh, the... Thank you. And the fourth thing is that I get my carbon footprint audited every quarter. Now, this is not just for companies. You can do this as an individual. There are lots of firms that can do this at a very low cost. So I get my carbon footprint audited right up to my ink usage, my concert usage, my air travel, my, uh, my uh, uh, land travel, everything is audited. And then every quarter, I have a discussion as to how do I reduce my carbon footprint for the following quarter. And I mitigate uh, my carbon footprint by tree plantation and investment in renewable energy companies. Now, carbon footprint mitigation is just greenwashing at the end of the day, but it just puts your mind at ease, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Pratnesh. Uh, your name is? I'm Pratnesh. Pratnesh. Uh, I'm from the batch of 22 for Cottons. Yeah. Um, there's this one quote which really, like, it reminded, I got reminded of it when you were speaking. It's by, uh, it's a very famous quote by John Jock Rousseau, which was, what wisdom can you find which is greater than kindness? Hmm. Right. And there was just, just one thought which I had because you brought up elephant relocation and such as other such issues. When political filters color all of these issues, I'm sure you found it even with the elephant relocation issue. How has music helped you reconcile kindness with the kind of violence associated with those activities? When there's this constant tussle between what's <coughs> right and what's wrong, has music helped you reconcile with a certain perspective on these issues? And how can it help others as well? So my answer is going to be a little tangential to your question, but I'm pretty sure it'll answer your uh, question. So the thing is that when communicating these problems, the obvious uh, uh, knee-jerk reaction is to show a lot of hate and scream and, you know, and make heavy metal music and stuff like that. We're calling me Noahim. You're going to be fine. No, no, no. So, so that's what. So basically, and, and to have a very negative approach towards everything, you know, with protest and things like that, when these things are actually quite essential, but nevertheless, that is the first approach that anybody would have. So I've always divided that when it comes to uh, advocacy of environment on environmental issues, there are always two routes to go by, which I have coined. The first one is called the Greta Thunberg approach, and the second approach is known as the David Attenborough approach. Okay, now these two things have always, like, you know, uh, kept me, uh, kept me thinking, and kept me, you know, divided on to what's better or what's worse. Now, the Greta Thunberg approach is about again shaming into action, about uh, about showing doom and gloom, and about showing a world which is in destruction, and you know, and all of that stuff. Now, the thing is that there is a negative and there is a positive of this. Positive is that it can get some immediate results. Uh, the negative is obviously it, it it draws away a lot more people than it actually draws people in. You know, that's what my uh, uh, assessment of this whole thing is. Now, with the Sir David Attenborough approach, it's very simple. The Sir David Attenborough approach is that he's been doing this for like, whatever, 80 years. Uh, his approach is very simple, that make everyone fall in love with the natural world, and hopefully through that love, people will find it within themselves to conserve, to sustain, and to protect. 
Because there's this very important phrase by Baba Diom, a Senegalese philosopher. He said that at the end of the day, we as human beings will only protect things that we love. Because that's who we are. We don't only care about our inner circle. We don't care about Kiribati and we don't care about what's happening on the other side of the world. We only protect things that we love. We only love things that we understand and we only understand things that we are taught. So that's what Sir David Attenborough did his entire career. He showed beautiful environs, he got everybody attached to all these species, taught people about these obscure species that nobody would have ever been exposed to. And you know, taught about the natural world, made everybody fall in love with the natural world. And every single conservationist on this planet, without exception, has been inspired by Sir David Attenborough. So even though Sir David Attenborough did not give out immediate results, like you watch a thing and you become whatever, but at the same time, pretty much every conservationist on this planet has become a conservationist because they watched a film of David Attenborough. So that is what. So for me, I try to follow the second approach through my music, you know. And even if I'm showing doom and gloom, it is always in a very soft manner, you know, with music that is beautiful and music that is, uh, uh, you know, music that is palatable. So I hope that answers your question. But the idea is this, that use music in a very, very positive manner rather than in a negative manner. Because positivity and positive reinforcement has got a much, much longer uh, effect on people. Gentleman in the white. Uh, afternoon, sir. My name is Arnab. I'm, a, I'm currently a student at Bishop Bond Boys School. Student at? Bishop Bond Boys School. Oh, currently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, my question to you is, with the arrival of a time right now in the world where there's economic crises um, with problems such as the housing crisis, how are we to draw the line and make environmentally sound decisions which are not just less convenient, as you said, but more expensive, especially for people facing financial issues? I agree with you. There has to be a very balanced approach. Now, I'm going to tackle this question with two answers. One is that if you look at India as a nation, India is a very complicated country because we still need a certain level of development for about 300 million people, which is pretty much the entire size of US, United States of America. So imagine the whole of United States of America needs to develop within India. Um, we do not have the facility of every single citizen of our country flicks a light switch and a light comes on, you know? So we do not have that level of development, that level of standard of living. So in India, through my extensive travels in rural India and across India, I've realized that there are only two kinds of problems in India. One is a problem of survival, and the second is a problem of thriving. Environment in a developing nation or a nation in the global south is always considered to be a problem of thriving, not a problem of survival. Survival is, survival is the other problems I spoke about, like hunger, poverty, education, malnutrition, gender inequality, gender violence, innovation, water, sanitation. These are problems of, uh, of immediate survival. So that is why most activists and most people, government, uh, you know, people in the government and people, authorities, they are focused more on that. Because only if you solve those problems, because if you use the Western narratives, uh, especially in rural India, that, you know, uh, uh, consume less of everything, they're going to turn back and say that we don't have much to consume, first of all, you know, or let's make a better future for our future generations. They're going to be like, what about my generation, you know? You cannot skip over a generation. You cannot skip the dreams and aspirations of a person. So that way, there has to be a balance maintained. That is one thing. Second thing is that, um, one has to do the right thing when it comes to the environment. That is very, very important. And, and there needs to be strong political will to do that. Now, I'll give you an example of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, when he's 16th president of uh, the United States of America. So uh, the 15 presidents before him uh, took, uh, 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 had a blind eye towards, you know, re towards, uh, uh, towards uh, uh, slavery. You know, they knew that slavery was bad, but they said that, okay, it's essential, you know, whatever, you know, like uh, for our economy, the cotton farmers need them, cotton is the backbone of our economy, so, you know, let slavery be there, it's all right, it's a necessary evil or whatever. Abraham Lincoln became the president and he decided that, no, it's an immoral activity, we have to stop this. And he fought a civil war to stop it. And he fought the civil war, and he won the civil war, he abolished slavery, and America only thrived after that. It did not survive. So basically, what we need is that we need strong leadership like that. Because what's happened is that leaders have evolved to becoming followers now, where they look at what people want and what will get them re-elected. Uh, because at the end of the cycle is every three, four, five years. So they, look, so they want short-term gratification of their constituents. And uh, they cannot look at long-term solutions, which is the environment, which is 15, 20 year solutions. They cannot, look, they cannot afford to look at that. They need to have short-term solutions. And uh, that's the only way they feel that they will get re-elected. So that way, that is where, again, we need a ground-up movement through us, through artists, so that the consciousness of the electorate itself changes. 
And once that happens, we itself will start demanding for these long-term solutions, and we'll start understanding when our politicians do stuff which is, uh, which is, uh, which is not giving us immediate gratification. Thank you, Ricky. Second last question, and then we have one more. Please go. My name is Gokula. I am from the 1969 batch. Everybody, you are mentioning about the songs which you had learned in the childhood days. Now, we have heard you on, on the screen. Now, can we, can we sincerely request you to sing one or two lines of your favorite song for us over here? No, actually, uh, I'm really, really sorry, but I do not sing. That's why I always hire good singers. <laughs> if I sing, then whatever few audiences that I have actually captured will probably run away. <laughs> so that is something that I strictly do not do because I've got a terrible, terrible singing voice. So I know my limitations, and that is why I'm not going to cross that. So anyway, but uh, have we, have we done with the question? Just here, yeah, the last okay. one. Okay, yeah. Ricky? You got the final word. Yeah, I got the final word. And I would like to say, I'm Wing Commander Butt, uh, 66, your Pope House. Yeah. And uh, I sit on both sides of the fence as a soldier, NDA, flying war in Lanka, and as a musician. And to cap your speech, mad is the correct word. And you may ask why mad, <laughs> because like you in your childhood, I used to sing a crazy song called, you got to sing the mad Bangalore song if you're mad or drunk, hoo-ha. My sis came from LA, she's also a Cotonian, and she went with a friend to a place in Shivajinagar, and it was mad, make a difference. And so I stole that line and added it to this crazy song. So you're doing a fantastic job, I must say. I have one suggestion based on your, uh, I mean, for your comments, not, uh, mm. it's a dual thing, based yeah. on your thing about you know, two things you educated me about the carbon audit. Yeah. Also about uh, the kids uh, thing, which I want to pick up that yeah. CD. Uh, I forget the name. And the third thing was about the farmer putting the bomb. Sure, sure, sure. Your question. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, uh, I want you to comment on this, the possibility of doing the farmer not putting that uh, bomb in there and instead putting an electrical fence to prevent, and then... No, but that's the whole point, you know, no, that, no, uh, I, I got your question. No, Yeah. but then encouraging the farmers, Jayachama, by having a musician's farm aid, and that money going for the farmers as well as for these fences to, for, to feed the ele elephants. No, you but that's the point, that the elephant should not need to leave the forest. And that's what we need to work towards. Because making walls and making fences was cutting edge technology during the time of Great Wall of China. You know, so, so we have to work towards not having walls and figuring out how we can have a peaceful society, not just between human beings, but also human beings and animals, without having those walls. So, but yeah. I mean, Musician. of course, we can figure that out. Yeah. But, cool. Uh, last question. That's Sorry, that could really you called, resist we'll this? Continues. Yeah, thanks, Romil. Um, my name is Geeta, and I have a question. Um, people say you can connect to God through music. Hmm. Um, you, the compassion that you display yeah. in your work and in your belief um, you know, justifies that. Any personal experiences, or what are your views on this? OK, this answer is going to make everybody hate me instantly. <laughs> so. Uh, I have to admit, I am a complete atheist. So I do not even believe in spirituality, nothing, basically. So uh, nothing above uh, anything that I cannot understand, I do not. You don't need to clap for that. <laughs> OK, so, so the thing is that uh, a lot of people say that my music is spiritual, and like, you know, it makes them connect spiritually, and you know, it takes them to a higher plane or whatever. But I believe that uh, what is spirituality? Spirituality for me is basically, um, uh, or what people call spirituality for me, is basically sometimes you go to a sunset or you go to a beach, and you see this image of the sunset, which is so absolutely beautiful that your primitive human brain cannot understand the beauty of that, you know? Or you listen to a piece of music and it is so beautiful that it just brings tears to your eyes, and you're not feeling sad. 
but you don't know why it is having that emotional react with you because the reason why it's having that emotional connect with you is that it's so beautiful that your brain is just unable to understand it, you know? So that is what it is. And, or sometimes uh, you hear poetry and that's what happens. So basically, I believe that if, if you create art that is so beautiful and it is so amazing that the brain is unable to fathom the beauty of that art, then, and it has that, uh, and people attribute it to spirituality, then you are successful as a musician, you know? So when somebody tells me that, oh, that music, it really made me think about God or it, it could, took me to another plane or whatever, then I'm like, yes. You know, I managed to have that connect with that person that, you know, that, that I've taken them to that particular level through my music. And I feel that so-called spiritual thing pretty much every day, you know, when I'm watching a movie or I'm traveling or, you know, or I'm just sitting down in an emotional state, you know? Um, or if I have a success, you know, and I'm thinking about it, you know, so that's the thing. So basically that is what I call uh, spirituality. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so, you so much. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just uh, uh, say one thing. So I just wanted to touch, because all of your questions were quite interesting. So I just wanted to touch upon something because I, uh, I remember that uh, inadvertently I brought up the whole Bollywood thing in the beginning. So I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> so um, uh, so that, that uh, loop is closed. So the thing is that uh, uh, when it, uh, uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about Bollywood versus you know the so-called independent music in India and the classical music forms in India and all of that stuff. Now, when you have a Bollywood uh, composer or an artist when they go abroad, like let's say to a New Jersey or a San Francisco or a Moscow or a Berlin or something like that, um, when they go and perform over there, they end up filling up a complete stadium, they end up filling up a complete auditorium, they have a super hit concert or whatever. But the only people who are in that stadium or in that concert hall are basically people from the Indian diaspora. Because ex with a few exceptions, Bollywood has not actually broken cultural barriers. There are only few exceptions, but Bollywood has never broken cultural barriers. So they, which is not a bad thing, because with 1.4 billion of us and almost like 60 to, 70 billion, 60 to 70 million diaspora, if you're just catering to one sixth of the world's population, that's also good. That's in fact fantastic. But what I'm saying is that they haven't broken cultural barriers. The people who have broken cultural barriers are actually the classical musicians. Now, I remember when I was 19, I had gone to San Francisco and I watched a concert of Pandit Ravi Shankar. Okay, and uh, I'd watched a whole lot of Bollywood concerts in America till then, but I, this is the first time I watched a Pandit Ravi Shankar concert. And I'm sitting down in the audience and I'm shocked that the demographic of the people in the audience is very representative of the demographic of the city itself. Like there was an 80% Caucasian population, 80% Caucasian population in the theater. 5% Asian population, 5% Asian population. So I was thinking that this gentleman, he is not aping the West, he is playing pure Indian classical music. Even when he collaborated with the Beatles also, he was not playing a guitar, he was not playing a, a violin or whatever, he was playing his sitar. So he was doing what, he was playing his pure Indian classical music, sticking to his roots. And even in that concert, it was a pure Indian classical music concert, but he was reaching out to people who are normally not exposed to Indian music, and he was reaching out and he was breaking these amazing cultural barriers. So that is what is amazing. But in India, on the other hand, we've got something known as the Pandit Ravi Shankar syndrome. Okay, what I call in India. This is something that I've coined myself, the Pandit Ravi Shankar syndrome. Now, what instrument did Pandit Ravi Shankar play? Shout out. Okay, what is the highest civilian honor in India that he won? Bharatna. He won the Bharatna. What is his daughter's names? And? Nora Jones. Okay, fine. Can anyone name an album of his? He's done 60 albums. Look at his Wikipedia page. 60 albums. And he's won three Grammy Awards for his albums. Can anybody name an album? No. Okay, forget about an album. Name a song of his. Or oh, hum a tune. Okay, you tell me. Huh? Where is that? Which album is it from? Okay, that's something that I've not heard of. But anyway, so that's the thing. So that is the problem that we are not appreciating our own artists because Bollywood has created this huge cloud where if I tell people in India that I'm a composer, the first question I'm asked is which film? Or if a, if a singer tells that, you know, I'm a singer, they ask you which, uh, which, uh, uh, which film have you sung for? So that is the cloud that Bollywood has created where it, where it sucked up all of these industries, not only the music industry, but also the fashion industry. So that's why it's important to stay independent and try to create an in independent music industry so that we are creating music based on our own sensibilities rather than what a director is asking us to do, rather than what a hero is telling to a heroine, or rather than an item song. Because if you look at it, 
Bollywood is making composers create songs that they themselves do not listen to. Like for example, if you look at my one of my very, very close friends, Vishal Dadlani from Vishal Shekhar. The more, right, currently the most successful Bollywood composer right now with Vishal Shekhar. Uh, uh, an amazing, amazing gentleman. Uh, like a person who is heavily into gender equality, uh, into climate uh, action, all of, the, all of the good stuff. He's like a gem of a person and I've known him for 20 years. His most famous song till date is Sheila Ki Jawani. And he's even written the lyrics for that song. And it's, the, it's one of the most misogynistic songs that you can ever imagine, you know? And the thing is that now we know that, okay, he was paid to make, uh, uh, make that song, so that's why he did it as a job or whatever. But soon your art is going to represent you, because if you look at a person like uh, Vincent van Gogh, Vincent van Gogh, when he, was when, he's, when he was making a new painting, I cannot imagine him going to all the neighboring art galleries and saying, okay, what is everybody doing? Let me do something similar. He would dig deep into his own heart and he would create a piece of art that is representative of him. And if I wanted to know what kind of a person Vincent van Gogh was, I'm not going to read a book about him. I'm going to look at his art and I'm going to judge him. So what I'm trying to say is that I would rather be uh, lesser known for the songs that are a part of me and songs that make me as a person, rather than being extremely well known for songs that don't define me at all. So that is the reason of Bollywood. With this I close, thank you so much. Thank you so much, please, please remain. Thank you so much, Ricky, for a lecture that I'm sure has touched everyone deeply in the way in which you wanted to touch everyone deeply, the Attenborough style. Uh, I, at least for me, I was personally extremely moved by the elephant story and the video and the music. So thank you so much. Uh, I'd just like to um, request, if I may request, uh, Mr. Alistair Fries, Principal of Bishop Cotton Boys School, uh, to present Ricky with a citation that we have, uh, please. So. Hi everyone, I'm back. I promise not to be here too long. Uh, just like to say thanks to everyone for being here once again. Uh, thanks to the staff at BIC for making sure this event went off smoothly. Um, you know, a big, big thank you to Gia who uh, ensured that all the slides were up in order. She did not miss a beat. Thank you, Gia. The flip side of the lights being off when I started uh, was that I couldn't see who was here. I now noticed that one of our former medalists, Tanvir, is here. Hi, Tanvir. Better late than never. <laughs> On behalf of my fellow trustees and myself, our deepest gratitude to all of you. Thank you for attending the lecture. It is your presence that motivates us to do this every single year, come what may. Um, I know we did a little bit of the national anthem before a different version. But Ricky has his own version, so I'm going to hand it over to him, and we'll end with this. So I'm back, and sorry for that. Uh, but you, you, can be, you can be seated, because this is going to take a minute. So, uh, this, so the thing about a symphony orchestra is that, and I've conducted symphony orchestras all over the world, the thing about a symphony orchestra is that uh, you know, you have various instruments in a symphony orchestra. You've got like a violin, which is sort of like a soft instrument. You've got a bassoon, which is a loud instrument. Then you've got a harp, which is a soft instrument. You've got a timpani, which is a loud instrument. You've got euphoniums, you've got flute and woodwinds. Now, all these instruments are not trying to be each other. A violin is never trying to be a timpani. A timpani is not trying to be a bassoon. A bassoon is not trying to be a harp. A harp is not trying to be a flute. So the idea is this, that in a symphony orchestra, when I'm watching a symphony orchestra while conducting them, the thing that comes to my mind is that each of these instruments is maintaining their own unique personality. They're not trying to become somebody else. They're maintaining their own unique personality, their own unique philosophy. But at the same time, when the whole orchestra plays together, they play together in beautiful harmony as one. And that is a representative of our country, India. You know, diverse ideas, diverse thoughts, uh, uh, religions, languages, culinary tastes, uh, people, geographic locations, but somehow everything comes together beautifully as one diverse nation and that's what always, a symphony orchestra always reminds me of India. So earlier this year, 
um, my favorite orchestra in the world, that is the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. I decided to work with them, and I told them that let's record the Indian uh, national anthem. And we recorded with a 100-piece orchestra, which is the largest symphony orchestra to have ever recorded the Indian national anthem. And uh, we recorded that at Abbey Road Studios, which is their legendary studio. And of course, there was a little subtext over there because, you know, like uh, after ruling us for 200 years, uh, I got uh, I, an Indian guy conducted their finest orchestra, that is the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, performing our Indian national anthem. So what I'm going to do is that uh, uh, to end the day, because they told me that they're going to be ending with the national anthem, so I took the opportunity that let's play this version. Uh, so yeah, so here is the Indian national anthem. So namaste, everyone, again. Today, we're going to be recording the national anthem of India. So the national anthem of India is that one song that brings together our very, very diverse nation. In fact, the first piece of music that I ever learned as a human being was the Indian national anthem, even before I learned any lullabies. And today, with over 100 musicians over here, this will be the largest symphony orchestra to ever record the Indian national anthem. And I'm really glad that it is my favorite orchestra in the whole world, that is the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> So, British and Indian relationship has uh, never been better than what it is today. And after ruling us for over 200 years, I think this is the best gift. <laughs> so, this is the best gift that, uh, that you know, a British orchestra like yourself, or such an amazing British orchestra, could give 1.4 billion Indians like me. So again, thank you so much for this huge opportunity, this huge honor. And let us give it our very, very best. Let us make this the best possible gift that we can give all of us Indian people. And let's begin. <laughs> 